Well, I hate to... May I go? Okay. I hate to start with an apology, but I'm sorry we ran out of sandwiches. I should have known better uh -huh. since uh, Steve is our speaker today. Uh, we are indeed in for a treat. Um, I have heard this book review and it is just uh, scintillating, I think is the word I sent to, to some of you via email. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, Steve Holland is a fifth generation Lee Countyan. He's a graduate of Nettleton High School, Mississippi State, and he has a Master's of Art in Southern Studies from Ole Miss, so he's sort of ecumenical. Yeah. And uh, for three years, he was an aide to Congressman Jamie Witten, and Washington, D.C. has never been the same. <laughs> And later, he spent some time with Thad Cochran, so he has an interesting background. Steve is also a farmer. He's a pianist, an accomplished pianist, a humorist, a raconteur of great renown, and in the Mississippi House of Representatives, Steve was known for his wit, his passion, for his eloquence, embellished with a little hyperbole. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I'm sure he will be sorely missed. At this time, I would like to thank Steve for being a representative and doing so much. Uh, Steve is one of those rare politicians who actually reads, and he has been a lifelong supporter of the Lee County Library. Oh, I forgot to mention, he's also the owner of Holland Funeral Home. I thought that was important. Um, Steve uh, also writes with flamboyance. If you have ever read his obituaries, you are well aware that Steve can make even the most hopeless reprobate <laughs> sound virtuous, virtuous and angelic. <laughs> Steve uh, has always been so very kind to my family, and today is my dad's birthday, so is that not, it is so appropriate that you are here. A few years ago, Steve was, shall we say, misdiagnosed with dementia, but God in his divine providence spared this sparkling wit. Through the years, and in spite of his affinity for politics, Steve's compassion for others, his unflagging concern for the folks who live in our neck of the woods, and his humor and grace have endeared him to many. Steve Holland is a legend in his own time. Babe, where were you when I was trying to get reelected two or three weeks ago? Jesus Christ! What an introduction! I've had a thousand introductions, but that one was absolutely remarkable. Could I get a copy of that? I'm going to show it to my mama. <laughs> well, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, Dr. McDuffie was my best friend. It's interesting when you're 50 and your best friend's 90. Uh, but we spent many a day together and I do love him and I'm remembering him today. I have to play for a funeral at the Holland Funeral Home at one o'clock. Or if I don't make it, in case I really get carried away, I've got a tape and I agreed with the family I'd play at the end. So we, we working that out. Now let me say one thing before I get into the book. Uh, what a great crowd. I look out across this crowd, and every one of you have meant so much to me in my lifetime uh, and my political lifetime. I did not make it, lost by 108 votes on November the 5th. Interestingly enough, I was born on November the 5th in 1955. Hi, Smith, you missed a Bible study this morning. Yeah. <coughs> Um, November the 5th, 1955, I was elected the first time in 1983 on November the 5th, 1983 on election day, and I got defeated on my 64th birthday, November the 5th, 2019, so that's, uh, I guess that's the trifecta. 
But I'm fine. I want y'all to know I'm fine. I have so many big plans, it's unbelievable. And I am not going away. I'm just adding to. I'm just going to stay right here where I love, at home, and do many things. Uh, uh, volunteer. Love this library, just as I always have. Uh, I have to be honest with you, I am not going to miss the Mississippi Legislature. Hey, Parson, I'm not going to miss the Mississippi Legislature one minute. But without being vain, they're going to miss the heck out of me. <laughs> How many of you were here last year when I was supposed to review this book? And I called the author of the book, the late Dr. David Sansing, my dear, dear friend, and Dr. Sansing had a hearing problem. And I said, Dr. Sansing, I, I, I want to talk to you about your book and how it came about and so forth. He said, you want me to review my book? And I said, no, I'm reviewing your book. What time do you want me to be? I can't believe y'all hadn't already invited me to Tupelo to review a book. So if you will recollect, he not only came, he didn't review the book I assigned to him to review. He re re reviewed the other Mississippi, which is a delightful read in his last work. Uh, Dr. Sansing died about three months after he reviewed his book last year. And uh, that's a picture, I don't know if you can see of Dr. Sansing, some of you remember, but uh, he was a uh, professor of history at Ole Miss for 50 years. And he just was an indomitable soul in every way. Uh, Dr. Sansing was beloved by his students. He was voted professor of the year I forgot how many times at Ole Miss uh, he didn't have but one fault and some of us that are are uh, followers of John Wesley and Jesus don't have a lot of problem with this he showed love to take a drink <laughs> and uh, he quit about five years before he died and I told him I said I think I liked you better Dr. Sanzing when you were drinking you were more fun but he was a delightful historian and a great soul graduate of the University of Southern Mississippi with his uh, master's and PhD in Mississippi College with his undergraduate degree um, and he, he's a great, he's probably the foremost Mississippi historian. This is the book, Mississippi Governors. It's thick. Now, does anybody know? By the way, I'm going to, I got a point of personal privilege. On one, two, three, let's sing happy birthday to Jane Riley. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jane. Happy birthday to you. I hope it don't hurt her, but I'm, I love Jane Riley. Uh, there's been 53 governors. It's five minutes after 12. How in the hell can you review 53 governors and do justice to them in 45 minutes? That's giving them less than a minute apiece. So here's what we're going to do today. Uh, since I'm chosen to be the reviewer, I'm going to decide which governors I want to talk about. <laughs> Uh, some I'm not worth talking about, period, just to be honest with you. Uh, I never have uh, had much affinity for governors. I got to serve 36 years, served under five governors. And I didn't hate a one of them, but I didn't like a one of them, really, as far as their position as governor. He subtitled this book, Soldiers, Statesmen, Scholars, and Scoundrels. And he hit a home run when he, when he did that. I love, I'm a Genesis person. I love the beginnings of everything. And don't all of us Mississippians love the beginnings of everything? When we meet somebody, first question we ask, who's your mama and where's she from? <laughs> and I'm sort of that way. Um, I learned about that when I got my master's degree at Ole Miss in Southern Studies. And I figured out I didn't have to have that degree. I wanted that degree. Uh, my late boss, Congressman Jamie Whitten, always ribbed me about being a Mississippi State graduate. And uh, he got me in the Ole Miss Law School counselor. And I had a car wreck on the way and liked to kill myself. And I just got out of the mood to ever go back to law school. But he insisted, even on his deathbed, that I would go to Ole Miss and get a degree. And I did. So I've, I've got those bases covered well. But uh, uh, Dr. Sansing really spent probably more time in this book on the territorial governors of Mississippi than he did any of the of the governors that followed. Uh, Smith, there's not a seat here? There we go. Uh, that followed. 
Mississippi became a territory in 1796. I believe I've got that date right. Uh, and, and the Mississippi Territory actually included Mississippi and Alabama, the states now of Mississippi and Alabama. And as, as it would be in this newly fledging country, uh, the President of the United States got to appoint the territorial governors. So the first territorial governor of Mississippi was a uh, guy named uh, Winthrop Sargent. Winthrop Sargent was a very interesting fellow. Uh, he was a Massachusetts Puritan, a Harvard Law School grad, an aristocrat, and a devout Federalist in the pure mold of Alexander Hamilton. The Natchez paper described him as a man of enormous intellect and ability, but fractious, haughty, laconic, and austere. Does that sound anything like any modern governors that we've had? <laughs> does to me. And he arrived in Natchez uh, as the first territorial governor. Natchez was the hub of everything in the Mississippi Territory. And uh, he made it clear the day he got here. He said, I don't like poor people. I've never spoken to a poor person in my life. And, and this place looks just perfectly wretched to me. Uh, he looked down on the Indians and the poor with equality. His first, first official business was not to establish a government. He'd been here one week and he said, there's something I know this territory needs immediately. This place needs a jail. There's a bunch of thugs here and they all need to be locked up. Well, obviously the citizens didn't like Governor Sargent. And so uh, it fell into a state of anarchy real quick. He didn't do much. Thomas Jefferson came along as president, and he replaced Sargent uh, with a guy named William Claiborne. And you'll recognize these governors. We've named our counties all along after these governors. Uh, William Claiborne was a 26-year-old United States congressman from Nashville, Tennessee. So he had some kind of bond sort of with this, this part of the world, such as it was at that time. And... Uh, he was exactly opposite from a, 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 an aristocrat. He was more of a commoner. And he got to Natchez and stayed one week. And he said, this is not the place for the state capital of this territory. There's too many people of like mind living here. So what does he do? <laughs> he just by executive order moves the capital 10 miles up the road to Washington, Mississippi. <laughs> Which I'm assuming, I've been to Washington and Natchez many times, love both. I'm assuming that uh, in those days there was probably a pig trail to get from Natchez to Washington. I'm sure there wasn't a four lane highway like we got now. He's by a circuit ride right a preacher exactly and uh, uh, so he thought that was far enough removed from the aristocracy to make it work and sure enough he brought a lot of peace and tranquility very quick uh, uh, to the new territory he was well received by everybody he established immediately the first university in Mississippi which was not Ole Miss it was Washington College in the new state capital and uh, and uh, Anybody need to get that phone, baby? <laughs> Thank you, baby. Uh, he did such a good job, as a matter of fact, that, that the Louisiana Purchase was coming about shortly after the Mississippi Territory. And President Jefferson thought so much of his progressiveness and his ability to negotiate and work together that he removed him as governor of the territory and put him as the chief negotiator and ultimately the first governor of the Louisiana Purchase. So we did good in him. The second guy, third guy to come along was David Williams. David Williams uh, was okay for all practical purposes. He was a North Carolinian. He loved North Carolina. He'd stay down here a week and go home for three weeks. <laughs> stay down here a week and go home for two months. And that went on for a couple of years. And uh, finally, uh, he said, uh, this territory is, was occupied by nothing but tramps and thieves and Indians. I'm going home to stay. And he submitted his resignation. He was replaced by a guy named David Holmes. David Holmes was a Virginia congressman. And uh, I don't know what you think of when you think of Virginia, but I think of a lot of good things. I love the state of Virginia and the people that it's produced. He served from March the 7th, 1809 until January the 5th, 1820. 
And it was under his leadership, because he had such great ties in the United States Congress, that he convinced the Congress to establish Mississippi as a freestanding state, the 20th state in the nation, on December the 11th. Uh, well, we're 202 years old, 1817, 1817. And uh, then he became the first governor of the official state of Mississippi. He won the people's trust and confidence remarkably. Uh, his hallmark accomplishment, aside from statehood, uh, was that he established Natchez as the most major port on the Mississippi uh, River. So it can be argued that he was the first economic development governor, Lewis, by establishing this great port of Natchez. He obviously wrote the first constitution. He was a brilliant but humble lawyer. Is there such a thing, Councilor Grass? <laughs> and he believed something that I still believe, but it's gone away. It's in the history books. He believed that the power in the state should be completely invested in the people through their elected representatives. So he formed a very weak gubernatorial system as a governor and that stayed until really uh, about 30 years ago or, or 36 years ago when Bill Elaine got elected uh, and got gubernatorial succession passed and that led to the removal uh, through a lawsuit, I'll talk about that maybe if I get time, of legislators from boards and commissions and established a strong executive branch and now it's gotten to the point where some days I think there's no need to have a legislature. Just let the governor run it. Uh, anyway, uh, Holmes was the peacemaker governor, and uh, he had some interesting provisions in that first uh, constitution. He had just enough Virginia aristocracy in him that you had to own, if you were in the Senate, you had to own at least 100 acres of land valued at $1,000. If you were in the Senate, you had to own 500 acres of land valued at $5,000 or you were not qualified to run for either office. So he sort of did an interesting twist. So Holmes was a um, very sickly man and uh, he never married. He's one of three governors in the state of Mississippi that never had a wife. Uh, the Washington Post said this about him. As a ladies man who placed a high value upon female society and the friendship of intelligent woman, women, uh, the Washington Post said that David Holmes had as many sincere friends among accomplished and virtuous women as any man of the same standing in society. His fondness of their society was very observable. Yet he never ever was interested in marrying a one of them. <laughs> so, uh, Holmes finally went away and went back to Virginia and died a couple of years later. And we get Holmes County, of course, from him. <laughs> George Porndexter was an interesting guy. He succeeded Holmes, and he was, Sansing says he was one of the most intriguing and tragic figures ever to serve as governor. He came from Virginia in 1802 as a 23-year-old to the Mississippi Territory to serve as the Territorial Attorney General. And one of his great claims to fame as a young man is he was the prosecutor in the Aaron Burr trial. Pretty interesting. He promptly married, went to, went to Natchez, of course, promptly married uh, a famous wealthy planter's daughter there and uh, inherited land immediately. And the, he was a playboy, so unlike Holmes. He, Holmes was a playboy, but he never married. This one married three times. <laughs> every time he married a wealthy planter's daughter, stayed married a couple of years and inherited a thousand acres every time. So he wasn't dumb. <laughs> Poindexter was very scrappy. He loved duels. And if, if you didn't like what he said, he'd challenge you right on the scene to a duel. Pull your sword out and let's go to work. Uh, he was so scrappy, as a matter of fact, that uh, he got to the point to where on the count of three, which it should be, Judy, he dug in on two. So he became known as a coward as well. And that didn't help him much. Uh, he, his biographer said this about him, if I can find it here. His p political career is an unbroken series of quarrels, and for the settlement of these he used the courts, his fist, his cane, his riding crop, his pistols, and his superb vocabulary of invective. 
No man has ever sacrificed more friends on account of ridiculous trifles or nursed as many grudges with more assiduous care than Governor Poindexter. Well, Poindexter ultimately, uh, he did some good things. He established the first, he established Franklin Academy, Academy in Columbus, which was the first totally supported public school by 16th section lands. He ran for the United States Senate and won. At the time the state Senate appointed the senators, it took him seven ballots to win, but he won. And he absolutely hated President Andrew Jackson and ultimately was put in trial for an assassination attempt on President Andrew Jackson. And he refused counsel and represented himself in that trial and got acquitted. So he must have been a pretty darn good lawyer too, you know. All right, we're going to fast forward. 1833, Governor Charles Lynch. Governor Lynch was a major socialite and loved to throw elaborate parties. The Clinton, Mississippi Gazette described him as follows about his partying. That's Clinton, Mississippi Gazette. A ball was held in honor of the Governor Charles Finch. He was given, it was given at the Mansion House. That's not the Governor's Mansion. The Mansion House is something that's gone now, but it was a big gathering place. And long will live in our remembrance. We are actually of the opinion that there has never been in the state a more splendid ball. Bright eyes and winning smiles and graceful forms of virgin beauty. Flitting amid the mazes of the dances, they were objects all calculated to obliterate the petty cares of life and transport the spirit to a transcending illusion. Uh, he did a lot of things, actually. He was pretty good. He established 36 new counties. Uh, he uh, came in after the Treaty of Pontotoc, and we all came in uh, about that time in this part of the world. Uh, he uh, made a lot of peace with the Chickasaws, who had already been run out by that time anyway. He established the first statewide rail system, and he also was the first man that had the wisdom to put the capital more in the center of the state than down in the, the south uh, western corner, eastern, which eastern, western, western, western corner, yeah, of the state, so he moved it to Jackson. And he... Uh, he established the first capital building. He also established parchment. The reason he established parchment was because the site that he wanted to put the state capital on was the state penitentiary at the time, exactly where the what we call the new capital, the 1903 capital sits, was uh, a long time penitentiary site. And so he built a new capital. An interesting footnote on Governor Lynch. He was the grandson of the infamous Judge Charles Lynch from Virginia who was known throughout the country as the hanging judge. That's the term lynching. So that's pretty good, isn't it? Well, Henry Foote served, Henry Stewart Foote served from 1852 to 1854. Not long, because he didn't serve anywhere long. He was a renegade, but he was a very intriguing renegade. Uh, he had a political career that spanned 50 years. And listen to this. He was ultimately elected or held appointed office in Virginia, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, California, Tennessee, Louisiana, Washington, D.C., New York City, England, and ultimately in Canada where he was sent to exile. <laughs> He loved politics and he loved playing the game well. He was a graduate of Washington and Lee University Law School and he settled in Vicksburg where he made his fame by representing riverboat bandits there. When his term ended in 1854, he was elected to the United States Senate and he literally hated the other Mississippi senator at the time, Jefferson Davis. He hated him so bad that he, the first week they were together, they got in a fist fight on the floor of the United States Senate. Well, the Washington Post promptly wrote that the only thing Senator Foote prized more than his own political success was the political failure of his colleague, Senator Jefferson Davis. 
Uh, Foote vehemently opposed secession from the Union. He was ultimately exiled from the South, imprisoned three times, pardoned three times, uh, and after the war he became a strong Reconstructionist. He was one of the first people in the nation, though, that came out for women's suffrage. And after all of these political feats, he wound back up in the United States where Rutherford B. Hayes appointed him the director of the United States Mint in New Orleans. He made a lot of money in that position, but had virtually no responsibility. Probably stole money, knowing his record. Uh, but anyway, he used that forum to go all across the country as one of the foremost uh, frontier men on women's suffrage. So he had some good things going for him. Uh, governor Longinot, 20th century's first governor, 1900-1904. He was the first governor elected after the Civil War that was not a Civil War uh, veteran. And he was pretty progressive. He uh, graduated, first governor gra to graduate from Mississippi University, Mississippi College. Uh, and, and he really brought the modern textile industry to the state of Mississippi, which sustained us economically for 60, 65 years along the way. Uh, he, uh, he uh, established the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and Dr. Sansing, being a big historian, one of the state's greatest historians, loved him most for that uh, and wrote a lot about it. All right, let's, let's move forward. Let's go to James K. Vardaman, the great white father. He was 6'6" always wore high-heeled boots and a black-rimmed hat and was pale as a corpse, <laughs> as, as Sansing says. Uh, he probably divided the races after we had had Reconstruction and some tranquility in this state. He probably divided the races more than any governor since the Civil War. His best buddy was another man that served twice as governor and United States Senator. Theodore G. Bilbo. Now, when you got racist governor James K. Vardaman and racist, racist, racist best friend Theodore Bilbo, you got trouble. And they created a lot of trouble along the way. Uh, one of their enduring uh, uh, situations was that they were populist, of course, uh, and they instead of going for the aristocracy, went for what a lot of governors since him has gone for, straight to the people in populism. And of course, the biggest group of people in the state at the time were the uh, small agrarian farmers. Uh, Bilbo and Vardaman both never entered the public without a red tie on. Everything they wore had a red tie. They were credited, the two of them, as they would go about the countryside and, and roust up support from uh, the working class people. Uh, they accounted as a badge of honor for hardworking poor Mississippians who labored manually as the sun parched and reddened their necks. Thence was the birth of the term rednecks. So that can be credited to them. And we still hear about them today. We still got them. Uh, Hugh White balanced agriculture with industry, and he was a fantastic governor. He was the largest man to ever serve as governor. He was 326 pounds and 6'6". Six, six. Uh, uh, he came from South Mississippi, and he owned great timber holdings down there, and he sort of modernized Mississippi. Yeah, I think so. Uh, then... I'm going to fast forward. I mean, there's so many governors in between that I could talk about. Uh, Holly wanted me to speak about Cliff Finch. Uh, I really don't want to speak about Cliff Finch. <laughs> but I'll say one word about him. We're now at a time when you guys all knew all these governors. Um, Cliff was an interesting guy. And he raised all of his money by selling rooms by the night to constituents in the governor's mansion. And uh, a lot of people don't know that, but he did. And uh, uh, a soiree in the Bilbo room could run you as much as $10,000 per night. And so that's how he raised a lot of the money for his campaign. He was an interesting dude. 
I saw his daughter and spent some time with her at the Ole Miss ball game on Saturday. Uh, J.P. Coleman, I have to talk about a minute. Uh, James Fleeman Coleman from Choctaw County. He was one of the most distinguished and prestigious governors in history of Mississippi. The Choctaw County was tall and stately looking. He was an Ole Miss undergrad and a George Washington University Law School graduate. He was a legal scholar, an author, a historian as well. His ladder of ascension including being a district attorney, a circuit court judge, Mississippi Supreme Court Chief Justice, State Attorney General. So he had, he had maybe one of the most wonderful backgrounds to be elevated to the seat of governor of anybody that's ever served. But he was a strict, strict, strict constitutionalist and he despised the constitution of the state of Mississippi. And he worked very ardently to change the state constitution and actually was totally unsuccessful at it because of the legislature, because who had all the power? The legislature. That's when it started waning after J.P. Coleman. And and so he he did a lot of good things. He 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 was in touch with the people. He was probably the most brilliant nationwide and worldwide representative we've ever had in a governor. And he, he did a lot of travel abroad and, and sold Mississippi to others in a great way. I have to tell a personal story that Sanzing didn't write about because he, he didn't know it. I know it. And when Bill Elaine got elected governor, he appointed right off a constitutional convention because Elaine had been attorney general and he'd sued the state of Mississippi about the separation of powers. The legislature can't have all this power. We're not going to have that. And he won. And so where legislators would not only chair every committee in the legislature, they'd be the chairman of the building commission and this board and that board and everything. So the legislature completely had a grip. Uh, Elaine appointed a constitutional convention and uh, for some strange reason appointed me to represent the House of Representatives and I've been there two years. And I thought that was, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, I know a little bit about the Constitution. Uh, and I certainly believe that the Constitution is the, the foundation document of the nation and our state. But I found it in, in imposing and intriguing and I got to meet for the first time Governor Coleman because he was appointed chairman of that commission. He knew my father pretty well. And uh, as a matter of fact, my father had been a colonel on his staff and uh, as a very young man. And, and so he said, hey, I'm an old man. And he was pretty old then. He was probably 65, 70 years old. <laughs> Just kidding. I think he was 76 when he was, and that's not old, but he had had some health problems. So he said, you know, I'm paying a driver to drive me to Jackson, Mississippi, and you drive right by Ackerman every time you drive here for the commission. Can I hire you to drive me to Jackson? I said, no, sir, you can't hire me, but I'll be glad to come by Ackerman and pick you up. I think we had 28 meetings of that commission. And for 27 times, I got to go by and pick Governor Coleman up and drive him uh, to uh, Jackson. And oh my golly, 90 to nothing. And it was just the most brilliant lesson in history that, that I ever had. So just about two months before he died in 91, I'd just been elected, re-elected again. By the way, we didn't change the Constitution there either. Uh, we did get three or four amendments through a lane, one being gubernatorial succession, which ultimately I think changed the face of, of the way government is delivered in Mississippi. I was not for changing wholesale the Constitution, but I was in favor of about six to eight amendments that were proposed to the Constitution, and I think three of the six or eight past, ultimately with gubernatorial succession being one of them. But uh, Governor Coleman got mad at me when I didn't vote with him in the end after I'd hauled him back and forth all those years. I guess he thought he owned me and he didn't realize I had a mind of my own. And uh, so he, he pouted at me a little bit on that last trip back home and he said, young man, I hope you live long enough to realize the error of your ways. And I did. <laughs> And he didn't. But he called me just about a month before his death and said, I, just, I, I think I left the wrong impression with you. I really like you. And I think you're going to go places in this state. So that made me feel real good. Uh, 
William Winter. Who couldn't love William Winter? Who couldn't love William Winter? He should still be governor at 96. Uh, I have ran my first election to serve under William Winter. I ran as a Republican. I have now been a Republican, a Democrat, and an Independent. <laughs> And the Democrat worked best for me. Uh, uh, but uh, I didn't make it because I lost by 61 votes. Couldn't even get my own grandmother to vote for me as a Republican in, in 1979. Uh, 80, 1980. But uh, anyway, Governor Winter, we know that story. He's a modern governor, and he, he education was everything to him, and education was in great disrepair. And a good case couldn't be made that it still is to a large degree, but it's a lot better today than it was pre-Governor Winter, and that's his his legend and his legacy. I had another interesting experience. I stayed at the Sun and Sand until it literally got condemned because folks had got everything from West Nile to, oh, it was a trashy place, but it was the legislative frat house. <laughs> and uh, I had a friend of mine who had been president of the business fraternity to o at Ole Miss the same year I was president of the business fraternity at uh, Mississippi State, and he was from Corinth. And he he met me at a red light. I hadn't seen him in low all these years. And he said, where do you live now that the sun and sand is closing down? I said, I don't know. I'm going hunting right now. Uh, I've got to live somewhere. Can't sleep in my office. And so he said, well, my father-in-law's house is available, and we'd like for you to house sit it. And I say, oh, my goodness. I, I don't know. Is it a nice neighborhood? <laughs> Well, it was behind Governor Winter's house. <laughs> Our backyards joined uh, on Oak Ridge in Jackson, and it was uh, 4,875 square feet with a 16-foot Steinway grand piano in the living room. I lived in absolute Eden for 10 years. But the greatest joy I got out of that was Governor and Ms. Winter opened that fence the first night, that gate between our yards. And uh, Ms. Winter declared to me that I must be missing my mama, and she would cook for me once a week. And I got to love those people like they were my own family, and they really were. So I've got fond memories of uh, Governor Winter. Bill Elaine, Natchez born and raised, Mississippi's only ever Roman Catholic uh, governor and one of three that never married. And y'all can remember, Elaine didn't exactly get to the governor's mansion uh, on a cloud of love, uh, or maybe he did. Uh, he was accused of, of uh, having affairs with transvestites, and he he had to overcome that, uh, and he won. But the biggest problem he had, and it wasn't so much that, it was the fact that Miss Evelyn Gandy was his opponent during the uh, primary, and everybody in this state loved and revered Miss Evelyn, including me, and happened to be a pallbearer at her funeral when she died, so we were close, too. Y'all have blessed me in 36 years. You don't realize to meet some of the grandest people in the world and to get very close to them, and I appreciate that, but Governor Elaine came in and, and under a cloud, let's just face it, it was nasty, and uh, he he, he refused to even have an inaugural ball. That's how nasty it was for him. But I liked him as an attorney general because he was brassy, like sort of, sort of like a president we've got now, but with a lot more decorum and dignity and morality, if I might say that and get that out of the way. Uh, uh, but he wouldn't come out of his office. I mean, he just literally locked himself in his office after he was sworn in. And uh, we were sitting around the sun and sand at the breakfast table talking. And we, uh, late Billy McCoy, that we just buried on Friday from Boonville, and myself was appointed by the sun and sand fraternity to go in and tell the governor that he was governor. He actually got elected, and you need to govern. So come on out and join us. And Billy and I got very endeared to Bill Elaine in that time, and uh, we visited his office a whole lot at 5 o'clock. That's not Atlanta time, that was Mississippi time, because he loved that New Testament wine, like all Catholics do. <laughs> And I developed a taste for something besides a $5 bottle of wine under Governor Bill Elaine. Uh, 
he really did a lot of good stuff, but uh, and he got gubernatorial succession passed, but said, I will absolutely not run for this wretched office again. So he served four years. Ray Mavis came along. He was the youngest governor in, in America at the time at age 39. He and I had worked together in Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. myself for Jamie Whitten, he for uh, Jim Eastland, and met there. He was probably one of the best educated governors we ever had, a brilliant man, undergraduate at Ole Miss MA in political science from Johns Hopkins and magna cum laude degree from Harvard School of Law. I thought Ray was an interesting fellow and so did uh, Dr. Sansing. Uh, but he had a, he was also a Fulbright Scholar and a Woodrow Wilson Fellow, which made him travel literally all over the world. So he had a, he had a broad brush. Uh, but, uh, and he was William Winter's legal counsel also. So he had the right mindset and everything. He just had a hard time getting along with the legislature. And he was a Democrat and I was a Democrat and I tried to help him, but he'd rock, rock out to the steps of the Capitol and have some kind of bodacious press conference uh, and uh, then come in and tell we fellow Democrats that we needed to pass that. And he never could get away from that. The one thing that he did pass that I was the author of as a second term legislator was uh, the county unit system of government in the state of Mississippi. And Sansing talks a lot about that because that was a revolutionary change for the second tier of state government, if you will, uh, in the five boards of supervisors that govern our 82 counties. And he wound up putting, I can't remember the number Sansing said, but I think right at 100 supervisors in the prison, which that sort of hurt my feelings. but. If you're stealing greater blades, I guess that's a crime. And he didn't have any hesitation about sending them on down. Uh, he also brought casino gaming to the state. It wasn't set up under his administration, but it passed under his administration. And he passed the largest teacher pay raise still in the history of the state. Uh, he also, uh, he also tried to succeed himself, but he was defeated by Governor Kirk Fordyce. Fast forward, Kirk Fordyce, another bombastic <laughs> lunatic. <laughs> Sansing uh, tells very brilliantly, though, uh, that uh, that Fordyce. Uh, really made a big splash. First Republican governor since Reconstruction. Uh, and I liked him in his first term. He got love sick in the second term and of course was having car wrecks and <laughs> you know drinking and driving and all that kind of stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Fordyce was the wealthiest governor in the history of the state. And I didn't realize that. I knew he owned that big construction company that built levees on the Mississippi River from A to Z. Uh, and uh, anyway, he uh, he served and did some interesting stuff uh, uh, in his first term and then didn't do, didn't do much of anything in his second term. Sansing gave great credit, though, to his financial genius, and I agreed with him and I supported him in this and brought a lot of Democrats along uh, to vote for this. He's the guy that's put into the law the 2% set aside rule which has established our rainy day fund. In other words, a state savings account. And, and that savings account has come in handy many times. It's now flush and full and we need to spend some of it on public education and mental health and that kind of stuff. But now it's just a savings account. But it's good to have it. You never know when a rainy day is going to come. Well, uh, Fordyce was succeeded after two years uh, well, I'll tell you one more story. This is not in the book, but I got to tell it to you anyway. They say that I was one of the most quotable legislators in modern times. They say that. I don't say that. But we were in the Capitol one day in the, in the second term. Fordyce brought a dog into the Capitol, and the dog crapped all over the Capitol, everywhere he went. He was not trained, and Fordyce didn't bother to train him, and he'd just holler at one of the porters, come get this up. I mean, he was just so bombastic like that. And so a New York Times reporter <laughs> was in the Capitol, and I happened to be walking behind Fordyce when Bentley did his thing. And he's Representative, what do you think about this? 
And I said, I'll just be honest with you. It seems like to me we need to train the dog and get rid of the governor. <laughs> and that made front page of the New York Times. Ronnie Musgrove was elected by the House of Representatives. He, he received the, the plurality and the popular vote, but he didn't get all the district votes that's required by our Constitution. So the House voted him in 86 to 36. It was an interesting commentary on my part. I like Ronnie fine. Uh, and, and Sansing didn't spend much time on Ronnie, quite frankly. Uh, but incidentally, the Republican nominee was Mike Parker, who was my roommate in Embalming school. <laughs> so what kind of vice did that put me in? Well, not much of one at all because my district went 1,800 votes for Musgrove and I voted the way my people voted. Mike Parker has scantily spoken to me since that time. He thought I was going to lead the effort because we were roommates in, in mortuary school and I just couldn't do that. I couldn't go against my people. Musgrove bought Nissan and he'll always be credited for that. Uh, he also bought tort reform which he ought to be discredited for that, in my opinion. But, but uh, the white coats came to Jackson. We had an 89-day special session, one day shy of the 90-day regular session. After we'd just gotten home and gotten used to the dog and the wife again, uh, he calls us right back, and we stay 89 more days. Uh, he also is the governor who established the Flag Commission to change the Mississippi State flag. And Sansing talks a good bit about that by saying it was political suicide on his part, and it was. If you'll remember, Haley Barber followed him, and Haley had the flag, the Mississippi flag, as his uh, campaign thing, and it said, uh, save the flag, change the governor. And the state did pretty, Doc, pretty quickly. They changed it pretty strongly. So he was defeated. Now, Haley Barber, Sansing gives him a lot of credit, and I'm going to tell you the man deserves a lot of credit. Uh, he was the finest political wizard that the state has ever elected, maybe aside from Henry Foote. Henry Foote didn't serve but two years because he was such a rascal. Haley, of course, was a lobbyist by trade and had one of the largest lobby firms in Washington, D.C., Barbara Griffith and Rogers. And uh, he had been Ronald Reagan's political director in the White House. And uh, he's the guy that got me to run as a Republican when I could have served with uh, Ronald Reagan. I've always held that against him because I think I'd have won as a Democrat. But nevertheless, uh, it didn't happen that way. And he actually came up here and walked some streets for me and country roads when I ran the first time. So we've been close personally. Uh, Sansing um, gives him a lot of credit as governor because he was a lobbyist. And you would think that's not a good fit. But actually, it brought connections. Now this was an interesting commentary. Haley and I also, uh, I got two of my ministers here. I, I guess y'all knew that I'd take a drink. <laughs> If you didn't, uh, if you didn't, you know now. Haley loved his maker's mark, and it was an interesting commentary. I got eight, eight shout-outs in eight state of the state speeches under Governor Haley Barber. For one reason, we played bad cop, good cop, and we knew how to work a program. Uh, when he Katrina came, and that was his salvation, he had just kicked 65,000 people off the Medicaid rolls and blamed that on me because I was chairman of the committee, and I fought it vehemently, but he, being the good politician that he was, my health care lawyer, and I didn't realize it, the whole division of medicine, uh, Medicaid sunsetted that year. So he ultimately pranked into my office. He says, Holland, you got a big decision to make. You're about to take this bill up on the floor of the house. Are you going to give me the division of Medicaid and let me run it? Or are you going to take these 65,000 people off? And I said, oh my God, I need to pray right now. And I had to, I could not trust him with the division of Medicaid. It's too important a program for our people and our impoverished people, our old and disabled folks. And so I, I sat on the floor of the House uh, that I asked the House to vote for this ill-fated plan. But I said the minute Haley Barber signs it, I'm going to start the biggest grassroots crusade this state has ever seen to reverse it. 
because I just didn't trust him with the whole program. Uh, he really never understood Medicaid and didn't like it. And it's an insurance program where the federal government pays 75 cents, Dr. Nail, for health care, and we pay a quarter. That's a pretty good bargain. I'd like to invest my change right now at 75 25 if I could. It's, it's not out there. Long story short, Alan Nunley, the late Alan Nunley, my dear friend, was chairman of the committee in the Senate, and of course he went to Governor Fordyce. And we had uh, 16 hearings around the state and had to have highway patrol protection, both of us, uh, to go hold those hearings. And Alan uh, ultimately, after about a month and a half of going to virtually, well, every region of the state and many county courthouses selling this case, uh, we were in Jackson for a meeting, and he said, could you meet me for dinner? And I said, sure, Alan, where do you want to meet? He said, Waffle House. <laughs> pretty interesting. For dinner, I said, I eat breakfast at Waffle House. I didn't know they had dinner. <laughs> but we met there, and uh, Alan Nunley grabbed my hand, and he said, Holland, I'd like to pray with you. And I said, well, we met this, don't pray much, but you Baptists pray a lot, so I'm sure going to listen. <laughs> I hope it's a generous prayer. And uh, <clears throat> he asked the Lord to forgive him right there, sitting at a table at Waffle House, because they were wrong. And when it was over, he said, would you go with me to Governor Barber? I'm going to turn on him and ask him to call a special session and to reverse that. And we did. And a lot of people got their medicine, but unfortunately some people died in the process of that. So anyway, Haley, uh, Haley knew how to play politics, is my point. And he used it really for the benefit of the state, and, and uh, Sansing makes great uh, reference to that. And Haley and I remain close to this good day. As a matter of fact, uh, two years ago, he and I were inducted in the Mississippi Political Hall of Fame and you talking about it should have been recorded, may have been, I don't have a copy of it if it did, but it was the biggest comic show you've ever seen, him digging at me and me digging at him and they raised over $125,000 for scholarships for the Mississippi Press Association, so to teach journalists. Um, who came after Fordyce? I lost my notes. Who was after Fordyce? Somebody help me. Phil Bryant. Phil Bryant. Yeah, Phil Bryant. Governor Bryant. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Pardon me. That was a little dementia there. I had to. <laughs> I, I, the press asked me not long ago, and I wish I hadn't said it. I'm I'm going around now since I'm no longer going to be there on apology tour for those that I said bad things about. But uh, they asked me what I thought about Bryant's eight years and I said well he came simple and he's leaving simple <laughs> uh, which personally I think that describes him uh, Sanson gave him one half a page is all he gave him so he apparently wasn't too impressed either uh, but he was the first internet governor and he's done a respectable job I want to give the man credit uh, he hadn't rocked the boat Hardly any, which is what I meant by my term simple. Uh, I mean, he came up as a deputy sheriff, and we love deputy sheriffs. Uh, I never would call him governor. I called him deputy, and that would make him mad, but uh, but he liked me, and I liked him, and, and he's going out of office, and now we've got a new one, and Sansing's dead, so I don't know who's going to write about Taterhead, but... Uh, <laughs> I like this book, and it's, it, it is a remarkable, remarkable, remarkable history of the state of Mississippi. And if you love this state at all, and you love history at all, you ought to go to Reed's Bookstore and buy this. It's pretty expensive, but uh, David Sansing's uh, widow, Miss Liz, would appreciate that. I'm sure she's still getting royalties off the book. It's Mississippi Governors, Soldiers, Statesmen, Scholars, Scoundrels. Read it. It's good. Thank you for letting me be here. Okay, I'm going to go see if I can make that one o'clock. Okay. <laughs>